Chapter 9. The Problem of the Blue Cap Worker The next morning found Hazel, Lavalin, and Lara in good spirits, despite the previous night. A light breeze rustled through the trees, and the warm sun tempered the chilly autumn air. The city proper was just waking up, and foot traffic was relatively low. The true beauty of the morning was not fully realized until after they had exited the third wall and entered a much more wooded area. Along the road were occasional cottages, interspersed with trees, flowers, and grass. The city had slowly expanded, and each successive wall signified more than protection. It meant citizenship. The first wall surrounding the king's palace, the first garrison, the royal gardens, and the hall of relics, was built in the early days of Coravain, when the capital had moved from Exington to the south in the south, and into the northern region of the kingdom. The palace had been constructed there to provide additional support to its constituents in the whole of Athelion, but also to escape the undue influence of its neighboring nation, which had pushed for a united country under the flag of the Knights of Petrum. Coravain had been little more than farmlands and a scattered collection of huts when the king built his palace upon the tallest hill in the region. The countryside was primarily forests and fields with minor variation in altitude. The wall encompassed the entire hill of Coravain and was made much larger than was initially thought necessary. As the fledgling capital required more trade and promised increased protection, more citizens sought safety beneath the shadow of its wall. The second wall rose two generations after the completion of the first. Wandering merchants found few reasons to, tra to travel through the region because of the lack of a protected marketplace. Recognizing the need for growth, the king constructed another wall which brought in permanent businesses and became a location for markets and trade. Farmers sold their crops within the safety of the wall, and travelers found rest for the night. The third wall was built when bandits raided homes in the night and escaped with little problem. An increasing number of people were drawn to Coravain, including members of the Council of Archmages, who wished to erect a school near Exington, but, at the request of the king, was instead established in Coravain, with the promise that those who attended the school would assist its residents. And so the third wall, whose overall area encompassed 16 times the area of both previous walls combined, was designed with the purpose of not simply increasing the city's size itself, but of eclipsing the glory of the previous capital. The population grew after the creation of the third wall for several centuries, with no one seeing the necessity of a fourth until the War of the Night came to Coravain just over 200 years ago. The lush farmlands had been soaked with the blood of farmers and massacred livestock in acts of wanton destruction. The king had lost his son three miles from the third wall. In his grief, the king vowed to protect his people by building a wall where his son had been found and surround the city. Such a project was ambitious to a degree that required multiple generations to fulfill. The meaning of each wall changed over the years, Hazel's teachers in school taught her. The first wall was viewed as part of the palace itself. The second wall had become more affluent in time, with increased security and low quantity of land. The third wall represented the people and the university. It was the hub of trade and the primary area through which the main road ran. It was varied in its makeup, with some loud and bustling areas, while others were nearly empty and quiet. It had greater connection to nature than the inner two walls, while still being safe from predatory animals and bandits. So what did the fourth wall mean? With the conclusion of the War of the Night almost a hundred years previously, many questioned the decision to continue construction on such a time-consuming venture. The citizens had many ideas, and while a few supported or opposed the wall's construction, their opinions hadn't changed the outcome. As Hazel walked in this lush countryside, she wondered if the creation of this wall would change the peaceful scenery. She had learned a decent amount of the city's history from her school, and she knew the third wall had once been just as connected to nature. Some areas were more heavily wooded, 
and a small river flowed through the eastern side of the city, which helped maintain a natural appearance. She'd seen more buildings rise within the third wall, when none thought it could ever become so populated. In her mind, this fourth wall was ambiguous in its implications. The walls could be seen as embracing the landscape or surrounding it. It could seek to trap and stake its claim on the land, or it could make the city itself more natural without compromising its safety. Like most subjects these days, she didn't know how she felt about the matter. The same apathy which existed in her, in her prevailed even now. She thought her old self would have felt strongly about the wall, and been angry or perhaps fearful that the wall would destroy something she enjoyed spending so much time in. But at the moment, she doubted even a massive fire would have excited much care in her. The further they traveled along the road, the fewer the houses became. As they walked, Lara occasionally commented on the landscape and how it compared to Treland, or regaled them with a lively story of a previous fight. Lavalin remained unaffected by either the werewolf's stories or by the beauty of the day. He'd spoken hardly a word since leaving the library, although it didn't seem to be linked to any foul mood. Lavalin left wearing a hood and a scarf to cover his appearance while he was within the third wall. While the rising temperature made wearing such garments uncomfortable, late autumn was often still warm in Coravain. It was only once they were well beyond the third wall that he removed his scarf. His garments, Hazel noticed, were primarily in subdued tones of gray, though the cloak he wore appeared to be an exception, as it was dyed a deep shade of green. Lavalin, I have a question, Hazel said. Yes? I know you're gifted in magic, so why not use magic to disguise your appearance? Lavalin looked at her for a moment. The sorcery I would use which alters appearance is imperfect. The spells involved aren't difficult, but they unravel easily, and draw more attention as a result. If you cast a spell to look like someone else, it depends on your ability to recall that person's appearance. Unfortunately, most find it difficult to reconstruct a precise face, and so certain details look... off. It's hard to explain without showing you, but simply put, it's easy to put on a mask, but challenging to make it convincing. The same problem arises when altering details of how one looks, say, elongating a nose or changing eye color. Memory thinks about such things differently than they actually are. Details are lost for the overall picture, and so a person who is paying attention can often see through the illusion. But assuming one can construct a decent disguise, the problem with Coravain is the third wall has a low-powered anti-magic field, which specifically detects and removes illusions. I learned this the hard way upon entering the first time. It took a solid hour to explain things adequately to the guards, even after showing them my signed papers. Oh, I see. Is there some other way of making a disguise that's more convincing that wouldn't be dispelled in the same way? He thought for a moment. Yes, though it comes with its own problems. Illusions, which are under the practice of sorcery, draw inspiration from one of two things, oneself or others. Illusions inspired by oneself are drawn from the mind of its creator. Thus, others will see my idea of a person when I make myself look like one. When focusing on another, it uses that person's image of a person instead. Well, why not use that? Wouldn't that be more effective anyway? It would be, for a single person. When casting an illusion on someone, it requires the knowledge that person is there. After all, if the focus of the spell is someone else, then it makes sense that knowledge of that person would need to precede the spell. Others might be added to the spell after it's cast, but if the caster isn't aware of a specific person's presence, then that individual will not be under the influence of the spell. Each individual will probably have differing perspectives towards that person, which can lead to confusion, especially if the spell isn't specific. If I use such magic to appear like a light elf to one guard, and then another I hadn't noticed saw me, I would appear as I actually am. The strength of an illusion depends on belief in it, 
so my control over the ensorcelled person would grow tenuous until the spell failed altogether. Illusions can be potent, but they are difficult to use effectively. There are other ways to maintain an anonymity, but changing appearance is harder to make convincing than you'd think. I may actually use that specific technique to set the foreman at ease with me. Interesting, she said as a blue dragonfly flew across the path. She wasn't sure she understood everything he said, but she had the feeling that asking more questions would only deepen her confusion. Yeah, interesting, Laura said, both hands clasped behind her head as she walked. I never knew much about magic. Werewolves can't really use magic like humans. Don't misunderstand, some of us can use a little, but nothing powerful like illusions. Lavalin raised an eyebrow. Most illusions are not especially powerful. She shrugged. Yeah, well, even the best among us struggle to use alchemy, so even lowbrow illusions are unheard of. Other Therian thropes may have greater access to magic than werewolves, though. Laura glanced at him. Speaking of great access to magic, how is it you use it without killing yourself? I heard warlocks practically explode when they just think about casting a spell. His expression hardened. Many years of rigorous training in meditation. Not everything you've heard is true about warlocks. Even if some of it is. He tilted his head. It sounds like we're approaching our destination. Hazel listened, but heard nothing beyond the sounds of nature. It was another minute of walking in silence before she heard the scrape of pickaxes in the distance. After leaving the main road, they headed west of the northern gate. They journeyed through the grass and trees for a few more minutes behind Lara, who noticed evidence of people creating a natural path in the direction Lavalin heard noises. A large clearing opened, revealing piles of gray stone, gravel, dirt, and a large square yellow tent, about fifty feet from the tree line. The site sounded busy with the clang and scrape of industry, and yet there was no evidence of carts, horses, or tools Hazel could see at this distance. As they approached, she noticed dozens of wheelbarrows, chisels, and hammers littered the area, but each tool was too small to be used by a young child. Hazel turned to her companion to ask their thoughts when she saw the puzzled look on their, both of their faces. Apparently, they were as lost as she was. A wavering blue blur rushed between them, chattering like an agitated squirrel before darting into the tent. It resembled a tiny blue flame. What was that? Lara said, looking around wildly. What? said a rumbling and slightly accented voice from within the tent. What do you mean there are monster people outside? The same wild chattering responded incoherently. No, no, yes. I understood the words you were saying, I just don't know what you mean by them. Huge? Do you mean dragon huge or regular-sized human huge? Ugh. Look, just because they're new doesn't make them a threat, and no, you're not being replaced. I... Oh, for the love of Tavik, I'll just see him myself. The tent flap op moved aside to reveal a dwarf with a dark brown beard braided short. While he was shorter than Hazel by several inches, his broad shoulders and thick, muscled arms gave him a physically imposing presence. His frame was nearly square and reminded Hazel of a barrel. He wore a brown apron over workman's clothes and had a long piece of charcoal behind one ear. A hammer hung from his tool belt, along with a chisel and various other implements. He swiftly appraised them and smiled amiably. Welcome, strangers, he said warmly. What can I do for you today? Uh, Laura looked at Hazel and Lavalin as if requesting permission to speak. We are with the Evenfall Vigil. We were sent to talk with, with me. He rushed forward to shake their hands. Yes, please come inside. It's a pleasure to meet y'all. I'm Riglin Carstaff, Chief Foreman of the Fourth Wall. The group entered the square tent to find a few wooden stumps which served as makeshift chairs, with blankets on each. 
The tent was ten feet on a side and a few feet shorter. At the back of the tent was a desk with notes strewn across it and a map of Ithalian, along with a more specific map of Corvain. A few barrels were off to the side along with some stacked books. I hope you'll forgive the mess, Riglan said, indicating the seats they could take. But I work better in clutter. I'd offer you a drink, but I don't have any additional cups, and the workers, well, their portions would be more annoying than anything. Who are your workers? Hazel asked, taking a seat. Oh, you didn't see them? No, Laura said. Or we might have seen the blur of one. Oh, right. Well, I'll have you meet the one who saw you. It's rude he didn't introduce himself. Zigglepet! The same blue blur darted past them from a hiding place within the tent to rest on the desk of the dwarf. The creature wavered in place like a blue flame, hovering just eight inches above the desk. The same fierce chattering issued from the little flame and was directed at Riglan. Yes, I know, Riglan said as if trying to pacify the creature. They're big, very big, bigger than me even. I could see why you'd be worried, but no, hold on. Stop, Zigglepet, just stop, damn it. The creature stopped chattering for a moment. That's better. These people are working with the guards of the city to help. They're checking to make sure everything is fine and ensure we get finished on time. They're not a threat. They're nice people. Now please take off your hat and greet our guests. The blue flame ceased flickering and took a more solid shape. The flame now appeared like a small hat. Just as the flame became a hat, the rest of the body appeared that was attached to it. He resembled a tiny human miner in virtually every way, except his facial proportions were comically exaggerated. An enormous mouth with a wispy white beard and a tiny nose sat under two small but expressive eyes that were set beneath large eyebrows. The creature frowned at them and stared before spouting some chattering nonsense and promptly disappearing from the room. Ah, you'll have to forgive him. The workers are a little bit jumpy. They're the best at what they do, but that leaves them imbalanced socially. Are all your workers blue caps? Lavalin asked. Hazel only now noticed Lavalin's skin and hair had turned pale and fair and now more closely resemble the Light Elf. Yeah, all of them. Not all construction workers are, but it's more expensive getting the human workers to travel three miles each way to get to work than it is these little guys who live in the forest. Plus, for as much as they complain, they love the job. So it works well. They're not suited to working further in the city since they distrust new people, as you've noticed, and that would set things back. Besides that, they also have a hard time with precision work, and most construction within the city is too detail-oriented to uh, work well with them. So, here they are. Hazel had heard of blue caps, but had never seen one. According to her father, blue caps were wild little men who enjoyed working in mines and were fae. She recalled the slightly pointed ears of the creatures she'd just seen, and it confirmed at least one aspect of what her father had told her. Do you speak their language? Hazel asked. Huh. I don't think there's a soul alive who does. I'm not even sure they speak the same language to each other. I can understand what they're trying to say. Probably some kind of fey magic or something. But I can't speak their gibberish. They have no problem understanding others, however. Well, as interesting as it is hearing about your workers, Lara said leaning on the desk, I imagine you probably want to talk more about the problems you've been having rather than the people who work for you. Well, you're not entirely wrong, the dwarf said, stroking his short beard and looking at the ceiling of the tent. But I suppose it'd be more accurate to say my workers are the problem. I thought you said they were good workers, Laura said, raising an eyebrow. They are, he said, but I think they've been going missing. Okay, Laura said. Can you tell us more? 
maybe start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, I guess I should start by explaining how the law works with fey creatures differently than it does with humans and dwarves. The king decreed that whatever compensation for labor is agreed upon by both parties is acceptable. Fey aren't allowed membership in any guild, nor do they gain residence as members of the city, but they are still bound by its laws and protections. This may seem unreasonable, but certain groups of humans tried to capitalize on having Fey join groups only to bring disaster on themselves. Since non-register as human workers, the accountability in terms of official documents is relatively low. In short, if they work, then they get paid. But we don't need names, nor do we need specific accounting. Of course, an unscrupulous foreman could hire fewer workers and claim there were more, which is why the king only allows a select few to work specifically with Fay while working directly for him. About a month ago, I was going over some of my special notes, and I noticed a trend that was mildly confusing. We had a surplus of funds from the workers that had been gradually increasing. It looked like over the past month, workers had declined in number. As you can see, these guys are mostly invisible, and they take random days off without saying much. Early on, their disappearances were unnoticeable. But now, I don't know. It's strange. There used to be triple the number of workers than there currently are. I've tried questioning them, but they aren't exactly the most reliable witnesses. Besides that, they may work extremely well together, but they're not community-oriented, if that makes sense. What trends have you noticed regarding their disappearance? Lavalin asked. Well, for starters, they were uh, those who worked mostly on the night crew. We do construction here at night and during the day and switch off shifts. I would plan the basics of what the night crew would do, and then the more specific stuff could be done under my supervision during the day. That was another reason I hadn't noticed until recently. Did anyone see what happened? Flora asked. Well, not exactly. I came a few nights, but everything seemed normal, and it was throwing work off track. Instead, I asked one of my workers, Blue Cat by the name of Garvey, to watch over the scene and report what he saw. He was one of the few I really got along with that seemed consistent and trustworthy. After that night, I hadn't seen him again. The dwarf rubbed the bridge of his nose. I contacted the king about this, and he stated progress was still important, and he'd send some members of the Evenfall Vigil to look into it for me. I take it he meant you three. Four, Hazel corrected. Our fourth member has a hard time in sunlight. Riglin squinted at her. You're a pretty strange bunch. What exactly makes each of you so special, if you don't mind my asking? Lara pointed at each person as she answered. Werewolf, green girl, half-elf, and the others a vampire. Riglin whistled and sat back in his seat. Well, when the king sends for help, I guess he doesn't waste time. I'm glad y'all are here. I'm not much of a detective myself, but I can show you the area and give you some of my conjectures if that helps. They all agreed, and the foreman led them outside and showed them the work site. Because of the swift, constructive capabilities of the blue caps, the site was recently established. Trees had been cleared away, 20 feet on both sides of the wall, and the lumber was stacked close to the inner tree line. Little flickering blue caps rushed back and forth with small wheelbarrows, or occasionally lifted massive stone blocks which were far bigger than any of the small creatures. What the creatures lacked in communication skills, they more than made up for in efficiency. The entire process ran like clockwork, with each worker never hesitating to do its job or waiting. It looked even stranger to Hazel, given that each worker looked exactly like a small blue flame. The foreman would occasionally stop to inspect the work and offer a suggestion or request a change that would be implemented quickly and with little protest. Riglin appeared simultaneously laid back and enthusiastic about his work. It was clear to Hazel that the success in the wall's construction was due in no small part to the foreman in charge. Unfortunately for you investigative types, 
I haven't found much. I've seen some animal tracks, usually deer, cats, or maybe a wolf, but few things are out of the ordinary. Laura sniffed. Have you come across any sulfur deposits while you were searching for bedrock? Riglin frowned. No, no sulfur. Why do you ask? I smell a faint trace of sulfur in the air. She explored following her nose. It's mostly around this section of the wall, actually. Really? The dwarf said, sniffing the air. I don't smell anything. True, but you're also not a werewolf, Lavalin pointed out. I don't smell anything either, but I'm willing to trust Lara on this. Riglin, have you ever come across sulfur when working on the wall? Never. Well, Lara said, maybe we'll find the sulfur source while we're here too. What time does the shift usually change? The day workers are usually done around 7. If y'all could be here around that time or slightly after, I'd be most appreciative. Lavalin had been muttering to himself, and a small swirl of smoke appeared between his palms, shifting color before settling into a dark green with occasional faint red ribbons. Tell me, he said, have you had any spellcasters use magic in the area? No, not that I can recall. Mostly it's just the blue caps. Hmm. Yes, I can sense their magic, but there's something a little different that's going that's difficult to pinpoint. He scrutinized the swirl of smoke and fixated on a small part of sparkling burgundy. That red bit represents something different from the blue caps. It's something a little more sinister. Possibly Fay, but the trace is weak. Which means either not much magic was used, the creature covered its tracks, or the use of magic happened a while ago. He stared at the smoke for a few moments longer before clapping his hands together and dispersing it. We'll be here tonight to patrol. Until then. He gave a curt nod and left the foreman. Lara glanced back and forth between him and the dwarf. Uh, I... Uh, I guess we'll see you later, as she followed the Valen. Hazel hesitated. I have a question for you, Riglin. Certainly, he said, walking back into the tent. How have things changed with your workers in the past few weeks? Were they always so jumpy about visitors? How have they been feeling? Riglin sat back, stroking his beard. You know... They have been a little sullen lately. I figured it was just weather changes, honestly. They get a tinge melancholic in the autumn. As for visitors, they're usually cautious, but they have been quicker to report disturbances to me than normal. Is there anything... Hazel searched for the right words. Is there anything that could catch them? Or any predator that might want to eat them? Riglin's brow creased as he considered. That's a curious question. Truth be told, I don't know of anything as fast as they are, and their invisibility would be difficult to circumvent. But now I have a question for you, miss. Why do you ask? Hazel averted her eyes and thought. I guess it was just a feeling. All right, then. Riglin said with a reassuring smile. Thank you for coming, miss Hazel. She smiled back. Miss Hazel. I look forward to seeing you and your associates again soon. Hazel hurried to rejoin them. Lara rushed after Lavalin and berated him for leaving so abruptly. A couple hundred feet from the site, Lavalin stopped and gazed at Hazel with that same impassive expression she was growing used to. What is it? Hazel asked. You didn't tell the tr him the truth. Levalin said. You saw something, didn't you? What do you mean? Lara interjected. We were both there. There's no way she would have picked up on something that neither an elf nor a werewolf could sense. That's true, Levalin said with a nod. Though his attention was still on Hazel. Except Hazel knew something about what was happening to the Blue Caps before she even came here. Wait, re what? Really? 
Laura exclaimed, glancing between them. You're right, Hazel said, meeting his gaze with her own calm expression. I didn't want to tell him about the dream I had last night. My dreams don't always make sense, but I felt like somehow it was connected to this. It might not be real. Besides, the dream didn't make much sense. I didn't think you'd understand, especially since I don't understand it, and it was my dream. I see, Lavalin said. You withheld information which could be detrimental to someone without the ability to comprehend its true meaning. You made a responsible decision. I wonder why you didn't tell us, however. I still don't know which dreams are worth mentioning, and how much of each might come true. Some dreams I have are pretty weird. Besides, I didn't remember my dream until I saw the blue caps working because they reminded me of these little blue fires I saw. Well, Lara said before Lavalin could reply, I think if your dream has significance, you should tell us all about it with Alistair here. I may not be his best friend, but we should all be on equal footing. You can tell us about your dream after we brief him on what we've discovered. I must reluctantly agree, Lavalin said. Much as I wish to hear more, it'd be best to discuss this back in the library. Perhaps I should start educating you on your dreams, Hazel. After we've spoken with Alistair, your first lesson will begin. Really? Hazel said with faint surprise. You want to start today? Of course, he said, turning from her with a wan smile. There's no time like the present to learn about the future. <laughs>